I just want to start as a lattice expansion. The basic issue has to do with the following. When you put hydrogen or deuterium into palladium, well, it stretches out. It goes into the interstices and it stretches out. So on this axis here is the concentration, which is the number of hydrogen and deuterium per palladium atom. And here's the lattice constant. And if there's no hydrogen and this thing goes down, it goes down to 3.89 uh, angstroms, and it goes up for a fully loaded cathode up somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.08 angstroms. Sorry, uh, how's the lattice constant? The lattice constant. So the, the volume of the palladium deuteride is larger than the total volume of the palladium anyone. When you put the deuterium and hydrogen in, the lattice expands, it stretches it out. And for fully loaded palladium against uh, basic palladium, it's a factor of 1.15. It's like a 15% in increase in volume. Um, that, that's actually a huge effect. I mean, ima imagine how you would feel if <laughs> you ingested uh, hydrogen and you expanded 15% volume. That's, uh, and that's, that's one of the, I mean, if, in terms of doing stuff to condense matter, that's one of the most extreme things you can do to condense matter. It's a volume change of uh, 15%. Um, here's a similar curve for town, lower concentration, and this is the uh, increase in the lattice constant in this town. And if you scratch it and look at these numbers and compare it with the uh, palladium hydride, they're actually pretty similar, you know, similar concentration range. And one way to how, how is temperature affecting the volume? I mean, that also expands the right? So are these volumetric expansions due to their loading? Um, they also being considered in terms of temperature? Certainly, um, if you take palladium and, and you freeze it to near absolute zero, you learn that at room temperature, there's a, a minor increase in the uh, lattice constant. Uh, I actually, um, I, mean, I, I, found, I found some papers that talked about that effect. I'm trying to remember what the numbers were, I'm getting in trouble, but I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's on the order of 100 of an angstrom or less. So the temperature is not really a factor in this volume. associated with each hydrogen atom that goes in. And um, in this graph, we've got vanadium, niobium, tantalum, which are the BCC, simple uh, metals, which can hydride, and then nickel and palladium, which are the, the basic FCC metals that can hydride easily. And there's numbers here that go from 2.64 to 3.13 uh, cubic angstroms per hydrogen. And that can be understood against the number, like in palladium, something like so um, cubic angstroms per palladium uh, atom. So every time you put in a hydrogen atom, uh, this expands out a little bit. Takeaway message, um, loading deuterium into palladium stretches a lot. The volume increase point here is 15%. And you would expect um, an increase in the elastic uh, energy of the system to do this. Namely, um, if you think about it, start with the palladium sort of sitting here it's under equilibrium conditions. You start putting hydrogen and deuterium and it stretches out the lattice. Well, the more it's stretched out, it seems like there's going to be a force that's going to want to push it back, which means you're going to take more and more energy to put each hydrogen. And so we're 
we're already being, beginning to see something that's interesting in terms of the uh, discussion. Okay, take away message time. Other questions or comments? Okay, thanks, Mike. Here's the phase diagram for Palladium Hydro. And the way, well, I'll describe it. So here's curves at different temperatures, 20C, 70C, and 20C. This is loading here. This is number of hydrogen per unit of uh, Palladium. And up here is um, the pressure in atmospheres. So here's one atmosphere, 10 per atmosphere, 100 per atmosphere. So um, once you Imagine putting a piece of palladium into a tank and then turning up the knob on the hydrogen going in. And then if you know the hydrogen pressure, you check and maybe weigh the palladium or you have some other diagnostic to see how much hydrogen has gone into the palladium. What you find is that um, as you increase the pressure, but for a very small change in pressure, that there's a very large amount of uh, change in the miscibility gap region and the amount of hydrogen that goes into the palladium. And then once you get above the phase boundary here, then you have to raise the pressure a lot to get increasing amounts of uh, hydrogen to go into the palladium. So um, if you think about one atmosphere um, of hydrogen, namely if you have a chamber you put one atmosphere into it, the question is how much uh, or hydrogen goes into the uh, uh, palladium. So at one atmosphere near room temperature, so here's 20C, room temperature is roughly here. So the number is about 0 0.7 loading. So if you, if you like, that gives you a reference. Namely, one atmosphere of hydrogen gets you loading at 0 0.7. One atmosphere is not a particularly large amount of loading. If you load it below 0 0.7, well, you didn't have to work very hard to get the hydrogen in because you didn't need much pressure. On the other hand, to go up in this direction here, uh, if you want to get higher and higher loading, the equivalent number of atmospheres you have to have gets larger and larger and larger. That means it's, it's harder and harder and harder to get higher loading in a bulk uh, lady. And the higher temperatures also lead to higher loading? Uh, if you like, it, it moves the curves up, so you have to work harder at higher temperatures. Oh. Namely, um, if you can get to 0.7 loaded at room temperature, if you go up to 120, I'm sorry, 70 C, then you got to get, I don't know, three or four atmospheres to get the same loading. And if you go up to even higher temperature, you need much higher. So it's actually much harder to load and to elevate the Now there's an isotope effect. So hydrogen, deuterium, tritium. And uh, if I look at this curve, if I want to get to my 0.7 loading, well, the curves don't quite go up. If I go for 0.6 or something, here's hydrogen, here's deuterium. I could have much more pressure to get the deuterium in than the hydrogen. <coughs> and, uh, and and um, that's important. What that means, if you like, if you're running an experiment and your deuterium has some hydrogen in it, well, you, your hydrogen, the, the palladium would actually much rather have the hydrogen than deuterium. And as a result, you can use this effect to uh, separate hydrogen and deuterium. And if you have a gas that's mixed and you load the palladium, there'll be more hydrogen in relatively in the palladium and some of the deuterium will increase, so you can actually concentrate deuterium or tritium uh, with palladium using this effect. The origin of the effect is, um, is actually um, reasonably straightforward to, to understand the physical origin of it. The, um, there's a zero point uh, energy associated with the molecule that's um, more in hydrogen and less in deuterium, less in tritium. And, and the, zero, the difference between zero point energy between the molecule metal hydride or deuteride is, is what it is that leads to this curve. So there's nothing, when people, when people see these effects and say, well, there's all kinds of anomalous <coughs> effects. Again, there are some anomalous effects associated with the superconductivity. But this effect is not uh, anomalous. This one's, this one's relatively simple to understand. Now, if you know the, um, if you know the pressure and you know the loading, well, if you know the pressure, then if you know the few gases,
capacity, we can figure out the mechanical potential. Um, the capacity at low pressure is sort of the same as the pressure, and at high pressure, there's a difference. You might say, what the heck is fugacity? What is this all about? And what it's all about has to do with deviations from ideal gas uh, behavior. <coughs> Basically, when you get to extremely high uh, pressure, so here's 10,000 atmospheres. You got a few gases, and it could be 10 to the 7th atmospheres, <coughs> whereas the actual pressure is 10 to the 4th atmospheres. So it could be orders of magnitude difference between the fugacity and the pressure. But the chemical potential is um, figure out the chemical potential and you cover the fugacity. So fugacity. that <coughs> you can start with the pressure versus loading curve. So I've constructed, um, I, said I took a lot of data and I was making a thermodynamics model together and put it all together to get this uh, curve. But for, um, I think this is palladium funeride. Uh, okay, this curve, I, guess, I don't remember now. So I've got uh, one pressure here below a tenth of the atmosphere. And then I go up to here, so loading of one, I'm up over 10,000 atmospheres. So if you want to load uh, a to one and one to by pressure, you've got to be prepared to bring 10,000 atmospheres to take. And that's not a non-trivial thing <coughs> uh, to do. But now I've given, or let's see, people have actually done experiments. Baranowski's uh, measured He's got a diamond anvil cell, and he's measured the loading of palladium uh, at a pressure of uh, 3.2 gigapascals, uh, which on this curve is something in the neighborhood of 30,000 uh, atmospheres. And the associated loading number is about 1.06 uh, for palladium deuterium. So there's experimental data at very high uh, pressure. So since we know the fugacity and we know the loading is a function of pressure, we can get the chemical potential. And here's a reconstruction from my models and calculations of the relative uh, potential of deuterium. So it reference it to zero in the miscibility down. And it goes up and goes up and goes up. So between zero and a loading of one, it's uh, somewhere under uh, 300 millivolts. And at 1.2, you've got to go up 380 millivolts or so. Um, how do you think about chemical potential? It's a little bit like voltage. Chemical potential in an electron is called a Fermi level. And in practice, you apply voltages to change Fermi levels of electrons. The chemical potential for deuterium and hydrogen, the basic concept is sort of the same, but it's harder to apply a voltage to increase uh, uh, chemical potential. And so you know, applying pressure of hydrogen and deuterium is sort of the way we generate chemical potential. High chemical potential means higher equivalent pressures. So some people look at chemical potential and just reference it to the pressure, equivalent pressure of gas. However, um, there's measurements that can be done as well. Uh, Fleischmann had argued <coughs> that in his experiments, the loading needed to be and the way that you could tell the bloating was high is you put in a reference palladium cathode and measure the voltage difference between the reference palladium and the, his uh, palladium cathode. So he was arguing that you needed a voltage difference that was like 27, 28 uh, volts, and that that would correspond to a chemical potential that implied pressure that was very high, so you needed to you need to have like, you know, 100,000 atmosphere equivalent pressure in order to get uh, what he said that was measured from the electrochemical cell. Um, I think that it's not quite right because the, in his experiment there's a contribution to the overpotential aside of the deuterium chemical potential that involved. And you can actually see that. This is data from Ed Storms who back in the early 90s was interested in the problem. So what he did is he measured his loading and he ran electrochemical current in, and then while he was running and loading his cathode, he would interrupt the uh, loading, and he measured the open circuit voltage. And what you can see is that when he did his 
slowly as these curves. This was a curve where the loading was done very fast. It was away from sort of what the people were doing in the for steady state and private conditions. So you can see between here and here that the open circuit voltage uh, increases by, oh, I don't know, 150 millivolts or so. So it's going from between 0.6 Several hundred atmospheres below deuterium to uh, 0.6. No, no, not several hundred. It's it's um, it's the back of the curve. It's, it's a small amount. Okay, this is oh millibars. substantially higher than 0.6 in bulk is, you, if you like, you have to work hard. It's, it's not an easy thing to do in general. For example, um, as we're going to find out, I think in the beginning of next uh, lecture, uh, in the MIT experiment, uh, loading near 0.75 was pretty much all that they managed to do. And did they get any uh, excess heat result? Or they already saw it? No.
sulfur of 206 millivolts for the barrier energy um, can be interpreted in terms of microscopic physics as having something to do with the energy difference between the octave receptor type and the receptor. At least, at least there, there are papers with uh, such an interpretation. We'll, we'll actually talk more about that. that's interesting is if you've got an estimate for your diffusion coefficient, you can get an estimate relating to spatial and uh, time scale, because there's a characteristic distance associated with characteristic time when governed by diffusion. So for example, um, here's seconds, here's distance. Uh, some of the, uh, the deflation and funds uh, work with cathodes that you were one millimeter, three millimeter uh, diameter, as I recall. So here's one millimeter. We take this and we go down. This is 10 to the fourth seconds. Uh, let's see, 3,600 seconds is an hour. So something like 10 hours-ish uh, diffusion, diffusion time gets you the distance of one millimeter. So the, uh, based on this kind of estimate, we see that uh, it takes a while for things to diffuse. We'll talk later on in the case of experiments at SRI. We find that um, the excess heat doesn't start for on the order of two or three weeks or perhaps a month uh, after the loading starts. And if you look at these curves, you conclude that this long time period that's going on is probably not related to this diffusion process. However, I'm not quite done with the uh, diffusion. Um, Baranowski very famous uh, Polish hydrogen metals experimentalist, uh, did some experiments at very high uh, pressure and found uh, diffusion coefficient for deuterium and palladium ones like this. And if you look at the sort of the textbook value, you get a curve that looks something like this. So you extract it and you say, well, what is it that's going on? Um, you know, I, I want my money back. Maybe I should have a better. <laughs> And then you, you go back and you read the fine print in the Fukai's book, and it says it's only good, the model's only good for the alpha phase. And the alpha phase in the phase diagram is the part on the low concentration side of the miscibility gap. So the textbook uh, value is only good up to about 2% or so. So drawing it across the curve means that I didn't finish reading the textbook while I was uh, working on it. If I um, construct a uh, equivalent uh, diffusion coefficient for hydrogen from uh, Baranowski's data and then additional data taken near the uh, miscibility gap region, I might construct a curve that looks something like this in the uh, beta phase. Um, there was an experiment by Menkoli and Fabrizio where they measured the diffusion coefficient uh, in a palladium, uh, palladium hydride. So here's the sort of the textbook value. And in the miscibility gap region, the diffusion coefficient seems to be like low. It seems to be a lot different than the alpha phase textbook value. Whereas in the uh, beta phase, there's a very high number, and these high numbers are sort of closer to the Baranowski you know, uh, type of value. So I'm scratching my head saying, what in the world's going on with miscibility gap? And uh, what's going on with miscibility gap may be related to a brainstorm in Onsager. And uh, Onsager, uh, if I, if I make light of some, so much more uh, interesting and sophisticated uh, notion of concept is sort of simple. If I have a gravitational potential, I can imagine holding something up and put a gravitational potential, I get a force, and the force makes it fall. So what's the story with the chemical potential? If I get the chemical potential, so the chemical potential makes something fall or push something. So the, the idea is that, uh, from Hotzacker's point of view, is that if you have a chemical potential, force, which is going to be related to changes in the uh, chemical potential. And, and these are simply not the same, and 
they're not the same specifically when it comes to hydrogen uh, diffusion in uh, palladium. And, and the reason it's not the same is that as we recall, the chemical potential in the miscibility gap is flat. And it's flat because it's, it's a two-phase region. Um, so for example, if you've got uh, so water and ice uh, together in the same phase and you expect the water temperature to be near 32 in equilibrium, if you try to raise the temperature, then the ice goes away, you lower the temperature, and then the water turns into an ice. And this is that, that kind of effect. So as a result, in the miscibility gap, it's very difficult to get a uh, gradient in the chemical potential. So if Anzacher's right, if Anzacher's right, then the diffusion in the miscibility gap in two phase region might be very small. And that seems to be consistent with the data from Mengele's experiment. Now, it's possible. You know, one approach is to use a diffusion model in the out region, data region, and use a, a, a non soccer type model in the miscibility gap. Alternatively, you can actually work with a non soccer type model and get an effective diffusion uh, coefficient without difficulty. And when you do that, you might construct so in the alpha region, we've got the textbook value. In the beta phase, we've got the model constructed with uh, Baranowski's data and the beta phase boundary data. In the miscibility gap, we've got Mendeley's data, which is sort of all over the place. There's a measurement with an unknown um, P to PD ratio. It's based on uh, a value somewhere down in this range here. So what I've done is I've constructed a curve that sort of takes a flat value down here, which sort of means the number is small. You don't really know what it is. One of these days, somebody really needs to go measure it. Yeah, so go curve here. But in the meantime, as long as I work with a model that's got a much about a smaller value here and here, then I can do some calculations and I can make some progress. Yeah, it's, I wasn't really sure what we're actually measuring the miscibility gap because I think like, what you're dealing with there is two separate phases right next to each other. So you would have like dealing with diffusion in phase alpha and phase beta, it's not like you have some sort of alpha beta phase in which you're measuring the diffusion. So you'd have like one some of both. I'm not sure what like singular single value you're measuring in the middle of the gap there. Uh, I, in terms of an experiment, you can imagine an experiment where you have a palladium foil. You have some pressure of gas on one side and maybe vacuum on the other side. So you're measuring the flux of uh, hydrogen and deuterium going through your foil. So that can be measured experimentally, sort of independent of what microscopically is going on in this building sample. So you're basically phases. just looking at like sort of a, a microscopic average. Yeah, which is, if you like, one of the reasons why the measurable data has got so much spread, because if you've got some of the material in the region that's miscibility gap, some islands that are beta phase, and maybe some brain boundary as well. Right. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like that's going to be, be basically just based on the, the uh, microstructure of morphology. Rather yeah, but it, it should be possible to get a single crystal of a palladium so you can get rid of the fade, the grain boundaries. And then imagine a very long, slow experiment where you do things very, very slowly and you measure the, the diffusion. Right. But one of these days, somebody really needs to those experiments and do them cleanly with the relatively thin uh, palladium flow and on different temperatures and just generate these curves and you know, let's get, get some data that can hang like that. I, I don't really like the idea of working with a bolted together curve that depends on a dozen different experiments and information. Um, okay, so a consequence of having a low bit diffusivity is that uh, if you start to load, and generate a profile like this. Imagine the following. So here's the, imagine that this is the outside of the cylindrical cathode. The loading starts here. So when you load electrochemically, you can get the surface loaded to be relatively high, pretty easily. And then once the hydrogen and deuterium is here, then it's trying to go inward. So it has to propagate. It propagates or diffuses. That's done by diffusion. Now, if you've got a discontinuity, 
1.06 number, Baranowski's 3 gigapascal number, so this is going to be plating deuteride curve. takeaway message we would like to keep track of the, the PD ratio. We now have a, an exquisite tool uh, to do exactly that. Um, so our older calibration class makes the loading so distance minor changes and occurs. And we finally reach the end of uh, today's topics. So what have we learned? with nuclear physics and the literature in the textbooks. It's inconsistent with condensed matter physics and the literature in the textbooks. Most of the early confirmation experiments were negative. Uh, substances. Subsequent experiments have provided a much larger number of uh, positive results. Um, what I want to do in this course is, and what we've begun to do in this lecture, is to take the experiment seriously and begin to try to understand experiment. Um, think about what, what the heck is it doing? How do we think about it? And, um, we've begun that process by thinking about lattice expansion. Um, for the phase diagram, we, we understood that it's um, a chemical potential. It's hard to load deuterium above. Um, once you get to the point eight or so, you have to be increasing the load to get more loading. And from the resistance ratio, we can uh, determine the loading um, and for those of you who didn't come in earlier this morning, warning, yeah, uh, this field is a very dangerous field. What can you do to destroy your career? You can destroy your personal and professional life. It's, it's interesting in that um, you go to school, you learn about the scientific method that you learn in advanced science by doing experiments, looking at the results, trying to understand them. Convince us that um, there's a gradient in the across.